I can totally hear myself. That is a little way too loud for me. Oh. Am I good to go? All right. Let me see if clickers and things still work. Clicker still works. OK, sweet. Um, so good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to hang out with me. Uh, if you are here looking for the microservices and serverless panel, that is not going to be here anymore. <laughs> it is right next door, so feel free to pop on over there. I'm going to take a quick sip of water because it's early in the morning. Mm. And then I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Corey Weathers. I had the privilege of uh, talking to a couple of you folks yesterday. Um, I also happen to be a developer evangelist at Twilio. Long story short, I also end up writing some .NET code every now and again as a part of, uh, one, my passion for developing, and two, my job as a developer evangelist. Now, the title of this talk is way too long for me, so we're going to shorten it right now and just say, this is going to be an intro to Blazor. A quick show of hands. How many folks here have heard of Blazor? Yeah, I was expecting everyone's hand to go up. Okay, good. Throw your hands back up if you've had the chance to play around with it, have seen any interesting videos on it, or have been exploring it on your own. Okay, good. This is right around what I expected. Every time I do this talk, people are like, I have no idea of like, what it is. I think it's really cool. Uh, and so I always think the natural question to start with is just what is Blazor, right? Um, as a developer, I, I don't know if you all do this. Anytime I hear of like an interesting technology, I just kind of go search online, try to figure out like what people are saying about it. Is it something that's interesting, fascinating? Uh, I usually check Google. Uh, sometimes that works out. More times than not, it doesn't actually when things are brand spanking new. Oftentimes, I'll check actually Reddit or Twitter, and that is a uh, go forward at your own risk because God bless you, Reddit, they have really strong opinions, and Twitter turns into the dumpster fire that is Twitter. But I, I thought this was actually interesting to share, which is, uh, so when I went searching for Blazor on Twitter, there's this thing that happened where they were like, yeah, we're including results for a, a Blazor, you know, like a, 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 a sports coat. And so all of a sudden I kept seeing all these pictures of like men modeling, and I'm like, no, this is not Blazor. This is not helping me, right? Um, but I do think this is actually super helpful, which is if you were to go do this search, uh, this morning, just on Twitter to see like what people are talking about with respect to Blazor, you'd see in one of the results, the ASP.NET community stand up, uh, the most recent show, this show happens every week, was all about Blazor. I think it was an hour and seven minutes long. Um, and it was really cool. So if perchance you get bored listening to me, watching me do things, you can always go watch more interesting people do this on YouTube. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and let you take a picture of that. <laughs> But notice still yet, I have not quite answered the question, what is Blazor? And you see I swapped the slide to, so what is WebAssembly? Um, this is where I get to put the clicker down and have a chat. So Blazor uh, is a framework that Microsoft is experimentally developing that allows you to build web applications with HTML, C Sharp, all on top of ASP.NET Core. Once you build those applications, they compile down to DLLs just like normal C Sharp does, right? And they run as a pure web application inside of your browser. Except in order for that to happen, it has to target a specific runtime. And that's where WebAssembly comes in because it then starts to ask, well, what does WebAssembly do? Now, as I said before, right, I go and I do these searches and I try to see like what the web says about particular technologies and this was even much more mundane and ridiculous, which is if you do a search on WebAssembly, you'll find WebAssembly.org. WebAssembly.org will define WebAssembly like this. This is the one time I'm probably going to read from the slide, where it says WebAssembly is a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. Yay for layman's terms, <laughs> because that tells me absolutely nothing in the world of building web applications. So let me bring it down to like just basic, right, plain English. Let's presume you've got a web browser, and your web browser is viewed by WebAssembly as a virtual machine. And in that virtual machine, you have an instruction set. Just like you do now when you compile applications and they run on top of an operating system, you have an instruction set that DLLs then target and are able to be run on top of. That's what WebAssembly is. It says, hey, if you want to go ahead and have a compiled application run inside of your browser, it needs to target this particular instruction set. 
That's all that means. We all on the same page? Cool, cool, okay. So, it comes back now to the real question is, okay, so now I said all this about WebAssembly, I said all this about Blazor, and really that tells you nothing, right? Like really, what the hell is Blazor? The way that I'll describe this is today, if you go to a web application, you know, blah.com, you go to index.html, you go to the internet, it does the DNS lookup, you get the page that you need, returns it back, your browser parses it. Everything you hear me talking about is happening in the browser, right? So your browser parses it, it finds the dependent resources, JavaScript files, CSS files, goes back and gets all of those one by one. And then for you to interact with that page, JavaScript is running inside of your browser. Imagine a scenario where that dependency on JavaScript actually changes. It's not as heavily dependent. It actually becomes more, the JavaScript is the lightweight thing that starts up WebAssembly, but really the stuff that's running inside of your browser is all compiled code. And so what this looks like in the world of Blazor is, instead of you going back and getting JavaScript and CSS files and, and the JavaScript is running inside of your browser, what ends up happening is you get a file that's called a WASM file, W-A-S-M file. What that does is it says, okay, go ahead and start up a WebAssembly inside of this browser environment. And I don't know if you guys noticed it, <clears throat> in the last uh, WebAssembly slide, it said that WebAssembly is actually supported in the latest versions of all the modern browsers. So there's some good cross-browser compatibility here already, right? And then the intention behind that is once you get that WASM file and you get the related DLLs for your application, then your app just runs on a client side like everything is normal. You would see absolutely no difference. And so I had to put this tweet in here because I thought it was funny, which is, a lot of people hear that and they think, okay, so what does that mean for like JavaScript frameworks? Because oftentimes with JavaScript frameworks, you know, we build all these ridiculous frameworks to allow us to make JavaScript easier to work with. And I thought this was funny, which is, hey, the JavaScript developers will find something else to do. Don't you worry. Well, they love them just as much as we love them, right? Because they love JavaScript and JavaScript is just as crazy as, uh, as we all like to think it is, right? But with that being the case, I think that's my last slide. We're now just gonna go hang out in Visual Studio for a little bit. Is that cool with you all? Sweet, I like that. All right, so let me kill this. And let me jump over to Visual Studio. Now, what I'm gonna do is legitimately just walk through kind of uh, how to get started with Blazor. This is very much an intro. If at any point you all have questions or I say something crazy, stop me, throw your hand up. I'm totally fine with the interactive nature because I think that's how we're gonna fill 60 minutes here. Is that cool? All right, so first things first. I'm running this in Visual Studio 2017. Um, it is often the case that folks are not working in Visual Studio 2017. And so if, if it is the case that you want to play around with Blazor, you do need a minimum version of Visual Studio to start with. That minimum version number is 15.8. And uh, I'm just gonna show you all, no, not that one. I'm just gonna show you all this. So I'm running 15.8.7. You could totally do this in uh, an earlier version as long as it's 15.8. If perchance you can't run Visual Studio 2017, what I would recommend is installing the preview version of the next because they do run side by side. They, they, you will not run into issues with um, in most cases, with project compatibility, if you open the project in both versions, right? That's the first thing you need. The second thing you need is the .NET Core SDK, um, specifically .NET Core 2.1. Why you need that is because Blazor, as it's been being developed, has been targeting .NET Core for cross-platform compatibility, right? And so, uh, right now, the minimum spec says 2.1, I wouldn't be surprised if that changed. Uh, I have a preview version of 2.2 on my computer. Every time they make some changes, it, it, they rev that up. So it wouldn't surprise me if you saw that change literally in a couple of days. The last thing that you need is um, the Blazor extension. And there it is right there. It's called ASP.NET Core Blazor Language Services. And what this does is actually install the, the bits that Blazor needs to run locally on your device. And you would get this just by going and looking up extensions and looking for Blazor and just installing it that way. Now once you have this, I'm gonna close this out. Creating a Blazor application is literally as simple as creating a, a new .NET Core web application. 
I'm going to change this directory. And let's change that to talk. Now, this should look all very familiar to you up until we get to this point, which is uh, ASP.NET Core web application, which specific web application are you trying to build? In this case, you actually see three entries for Blazor, and you're probably wondering, okay, why are there three? What are the differences? The first one, the one that's already highlighted, is the one that we've been talking about already, which is you start up an application, or you want to start up an application that runs on the client side, works really well for the, a single page application, right? Um, you'll have everything download locally on your device, and then uh, uh, you more than likely use HTTP requests or APIs to help you get connected up to data outside of that specific app. That's the first one. The second one says, okay, well, what if you want to build your own API behind the scenes, right? Because oftentimes with single page applications, in order to get data in or out, you use some sort of API, microservice, some sort of REST call behind the scenes. And so this is just Visual Studio trying to be nice and say, hey, we think we want to help you out. We'll give you the, your Blazor client app, but we'll also give you a server app, right? And that way, if you want a server API project, and that way, if you want to go build out your API, you just keep doing that. And it'll give you like some shared libraries and all this fun stuff. That's really not as interesting. This one's actually much more interesting. So what the server side one is, is uh, this construct that, remember earlier when I said to you, in the world of Blazor, when you run a Blazor web application, it downloads a WASM file and it downloads the DLLs that you need to run the application. What if you did not want to do that? but you still wanted to run a Blazor application. This third one is what we call server-side Blazor. It's this idea that you would have that Blazor process hosted in an ASP.NET Core server process. And then to communicate back and forth with the server, instead of you using JavaScript, for, I'm sorry, instead of you using HTTP requests uh, for like API calls and things like that, you'd use Azure SignalR to continue to make the necessary changes. So say, for instance, you want to click on a button and that button does a thing. Well, behind the scenes, it's using Azure SignalR to, to connect up to the server, get what it needs, and then come back to the client and run that actual process, that method, whatever it is. Does that all make sense? Okay. Go ahead. Good question. So the question is, would you need an Azure account to create that project? In the future, yes. Today, they're using a version of ASP.NET Core SignalR um, that is pretty much RTM or it's general availability ready. And so you wouldn't need that to, uh, to run locally, but you, you would need it to deploy. Any other questions? Sweet, all right, cool. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on Blazor because I wanna keep things really simple. And the first thing I'm actually gonna do is just run this project. I'm, I don't even wanna talk about what's in the project yet because I don't wanna get you all confused. So, what happens as a part of the build process, because this is actually really important. Remember I said it takes uh, HTML and C Sharp and turns it into a web application. And uh, what happens as a part of that is your application, oh this always happens, give me one second, let me close that out. Yeah, this is the one that I need. And let me actually kill this. And let's do this in Chrome. Okay. And I want to open up the dev tools. And we're going to do this again. Okay. Yes, that's what I wanted. So, this is just from me pressing run. I didn't make any code changes, I didn't do anything. It's really important to call this out. The reason why is because your application has a bunch of C-sharp code inside of it, right, that's interacting with the browser, right? There are some times where you'll include things that you don't actually need. And so what Blazor does as a part of the framework, as a, as a part of the build process, it will go through and remove any code that is not actually being used. Why am I saying this to you? Because you'll see, you're seeing a couple of things here. Obviously, you see like the request to localhost here in the dev tools. You see this bootstrap stuff, right, just to get the site set up. And then there's this Blazor WebAssembly.js. What is this? This is the thing that actually sets up Blazor to run inside of your browser. 
So the thing is, yes, WebAssembly exists, and yes, we have this application that's now built with DLLs and all this fun stuff, but the web was not built with this in mind, right? It was still built with the notion of what does it mean to do HTML and to allow scripting to work, and we've gotten really good at that. So we're still using JavaScript here to bootstrap Blazor, to get it set up, to get it running. The other thing that's actually really important is this Blazor boot.json. And let me see if I can actually pop this out. Because what's in here is all of the information about your application, which is why it's super important. It says, hey, this is the main DLL that you need to actually run the app. This is how we start our application. Here are all the assembly references that we need for this application to actually continue to work. And if you notice it, there's a bunch of like Microsoft DLLs in here by default just to enable things to work. Um, and most of that's Blazor stuff. And then you'll see some extensions, uh, dependency injection, and I think configuration. Oh, and JS, JS interop, which allows you to call into JavaScript from your C-sharp code, right? And then you see this fun stuff about mono and the system.dll and all of these fun things. Now, why am I showing this to you? Because yes, what this looks like is we are pretty much downloading a version of Mono and the dependent DLLs to the client side for this web application to work. So this is the point where people start to say, okay, well, what about things like security? What about things like privacy? What about things like um, uh, uh, performance? Um, I'll tackle performance first, because that's the easier one, which is uh, it is the case, as, as has always been the case, that running native code is generally faster than running JavaScript code because JavaScript code has to get interpreted. And that interpretation always takes a little bit longer, though we have done things to speed that up. Performance is not a thing that I would be concerned about yet. And I'll show you why I say yet. When we talk about things like security, completely spot on. This is why you gotta think about how you sign those DLLs, what specific uh, certificates you use to sign those DLLs, and uh, reducing the amount or the number of DLLs that you expose to the client whenever it is that you build a Blazor application but you should have that concern for any application that you build, right? Same is true for privacy, which is if in fact someone wanted to reverse engineer your code, you should be thinking about how you can uh, make that e either more difficult or open sourcing your application. Does that all kind of make sense? So then what you'll see here is this mono.js, which kind of starts up mono, mono.wasm, which says, okay, now that mono's running, Take these DLLs and convert that because we know how the, C, how the .NET uh, compilation process works, right? We take C Sharp, we compile that to IL. That IL then needs to be con, uh, translated into machine level code. That mono.wasm does that for WebAssembly very specifically. So this is all still running on top of WebAssembly. It's just C Sharp code. And then you see the request for all the DLLs. Now, I want to show you all something really quickly, which is, let me close that. If you look at, just in total, the amount of content that we just downloaded, we're talking about 1.9 megs, really small. Obviously, I did this locally, so the amount of time it took was you know, a couple of milliseconds or a couple hundred milliseconds, but legitimately, one of the questions that people ask is, hey, if this is Blazor and it targets ASP.NET Core, why are we using Mono? Right? Like, it doesn't kind of make sense because they, they're in the world of .NET, they're two completely different runtimes. And the reason why is because ASP.NET Core was built with the idea of building server based applications. Mono built with the idea of client side applications that are uh, cross platform. And so, Blazor is a client side framework. The intention is that your application runs on the client, just like a single page application would. And so they've updated and they've changed stuff with Mono to enable it to run with WebAssembly, right? Keeping this in mind, one of the questions that folks have asked is like, well, .NET Core is going in the direction of trying to allow you to build desktop applications. So .NET Core 3.0 is gonna say, hey, you can build a desktop app cross-platform in C Sharp or .NET languages that support .NET Core 3.0. What does that mean for this? And my response to that is usually nothing. And the reason why is because the changes that they've had to make to Mono to enable it to run on top of WebAssembly are not insignificant. So what I would expect, at least in the immediate future, is that Microsoft would continue to 
make those changes and investments into the model runtime, which is still used in Xamarin, still used in a number of other places, but then uh, if at some point they realize that they need to convert that over to .NET Core, they will do as much as they can to reduce the damage, because there are some, run, uh, some namespace differences between the two runtimes. That all making sense? Let me stop and see if folks have questions. Okay, good. So I just showed you an app. This is just a basic app that just comes from the project. There's a lot here already. It's almost like phew. So instead of showing you all this fun stuff, let me actually show you how to build in a, a thing, right, and like what you get with the project. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump back over to Visual Studio and stop this. Now, quick show of hands. How many folks have used ASP.NET Core for web applications? Okay, good. So most folks are comfortable then with the structure of this project because this project looks pretty familiar, right? Where in a typical ASP.NET Core app, you see your program.cs, which is your main entry point. You see a startup.cs where you configure your middleware. The key difference is for Blazor specifically is this interesting thing called the Blazor WebAssembly host. What is this? This is the, the key difference here says, hey, uh, from a .NET point of view, we understand that the targeted DLL is going to be built outside of this project is going to run towards Blazor. It's gonna run on top of Blazor. So because that's the case, we need a Blazor assembly host. And, and then you have this create default builder. What does that do? That says, okay, well, we're gonna go ahead and like typically in the .NET Core application, it sets up things like um, uh, static file, uh, or browsing, it sets up things like uh, com in environment config, so making sure that you can read your config variables and things like that. In this case, what it does is it says, okay, well we know we're gonna be serving back DLLs. We know we're gonna be serving back a WASM file, which is an octet file. Let's make sure that that works behind the scenes. And then use Blazor startup says, okay, this is where we go to configure our middleware. Very familiar, feels not too uncomfortable at this point. Then when you look at your middleware, exactly the same. There's a configure services and there's a configure method where configure services says, sign up all services that you think you're gonna use, and then configure says for your application, actually go ahead and configure them. Now there's one thing that's really interesting here that I need to call out and I haven't talked about it at all, I haven't even used the word at all, and it's really important, which is, there's this method here called add component. Why is this important? Because in the world of Blazor, Blazor likes to think of applications as a series or collection of components. So it's this notion that everything you see on the page can be one or more components, and I'll show you an example of what I mean. When you look at this web app, this is the same web application, right? When I change this view, I've now switched to a different component. When I change this view, I've now switched to a different component. If I click on this button, I'm doing something that is uh, isolated to just functionality inside of an individual component. Even this entire frame is its own component. And how you can tell that is, if you were to just look at the source code for this index.html, you see this app tag. The app tag is the app component, the same app component that we were just looking at inside of our code. Does that make sense? So now some of you are probably wondering, well, how does that get translated to actual like HTML? So I'm gonna jump over and show you one of the pages. And this in itself is its individual component. So what is a component? A component is literally just a CS HTML page. And in that CSHTML page, you put some Razor code, i.e. browser plus Razor is Blazor. Is that all making sense so far? And in that page, you have just the, the specific route for how to get to that particular page, I'm sorry, in that CSHTML, and then any HTML code that you wanna render. Now it just so happens that this particular page also has this notion of a child component. So there's a separate component inside of this that's called a survey prompt. And that survey prompt has a parameter and this itself is a child component that it can then be reused on other pages. And the code for that looks exactly the same. <laughs> it's just HTML, right, with some additional razor. Now, what makes this special? Because there is one thing in this file that makes this special. 
Are you all seeing something in here that you didn't see in the other CSHTML file? What is that? I'm seeing some nods. Say it again. Yes, that functions block. So what is this functions block? One, the functions block is not specific to Blazor. This actually exists inside of Razor today. It's the first thing. But what functions does is it gives you the capability to write the code that interacts with your browser. It just so happens that here we have this parameter attribute because if you notice it, survey prompt title maps back to our title parameter. But if I took this parameter attribute off and I removed that title value, this would all still work just the same. I promise you it would make no difference. And so you could add anything you almost want inside of a functions block. You could add a class, you could add a property, you could add private variables, you could add methods, both asynchronous and synchronous, completely up to you. Good question. So I'm, I'm gonna synthesize the question a little bit for the, the, the purposes of the larger group, which is, this feels very familiar to the Polymer set of web components. And inside of there, you have these properties where you can get and set the values, just like we see here. Is there some sort of data binding that we can do with Blazor? Yes. There are three different ways that you do data binding um, inside of Blazor. And I'm gonna cover two of them, because one of them we don't have a clear example of, um, at least in the project and it actually gets a little bit crazy. Uh, but the first way is by doing something that looks like this. So say I have a p tag, and this p tag just says, uh, has a, um, what's the right property I wanna use here? Hmm. The way I wanna do this, I don't wanna use a p tag, let me use an h1. And, or H2, and the reason why I'm doing this is because I wanna say this is my binding. And here, inside of my functions, I'm gonna add some code, and here I'm gonna put uh, whatever I wanna put. So I can say int size equals uh, get set, and set that equal to uh, 10. Right? And then here, what I can do is say something that looks like, so you'll see this weird property here. This is the first way, where it says bind, and then the thing that you put next to this would be size. And what that does is it says, okay, from this binding, connect to this particular property. And then here you'd set some ridiculous value, whatever that may be, so you could say that was 23, right? It doesn't, the reason why this is given this is because of the fact that I haven't put an on change property here. Um, but the intention behind this is to say, if you wanna bind to that particular property, you can do it this way, that's the first way. Second way you could do this is by picking a generic property, right? So I'm just gonna say, uh, what would this be? I'm gonna change this to a string because it makes this actually a lot easier. And I'm gonna use class just because it's easy to demo. But this is the second way that you do data binding. So you just literally take an attribute, whatever that attribute is, and if you wanna bind it to a property, you put the ampersand on the front, of, um, you put the at on the front of it, and then you put the property name. Go ahead. You can also do that as well. Um, and the way that you do that, it gets a lot of fun. So let me actually just show a basic example of that, which is here I'm gonna add a CS file and I'm gonna call this generic demo. And inside of this class, what you have to do is have it derived from a specific base class. And I believe that class is now called Blazor Base Component. And 
Visual Studio is going to keep me honest. Yeah, no, that was still right. But, hold on. I always get this class name wrong because they've just changed it. So, I'm going to go pull up the docs because this is one of the fun things about good old uh, Blazor development is that whenever they rev it, they do make some changes that will sometimes break you, which is why it's still very experimental. Come on, internet. Okay, so I'm going to go blazor.net. I'm going to go docs. Uh, components, code behind. Oh, it's Blazor component now. Okay, so let me take that out. And then take that, add in that using at the top, right? And then what you do is if you want to put a property back here, say like public string value, uh, and I'll just say get set. I'll, and, and you see, I always set this to like some default value. And the reason why is because it's HTML, stuff is gonna show up on the browser. You always wanna make sure that there's something that's going to happen. So set this to my random default. Then what you do is inside of the component that you wanna use this behind the, the, the code behind experience in. Yeah, that's fine. generic demo. And then here, after you put this implements, whatever that class is, you can use that property. So I could even take this out, right? And what did I name that? I named it value, and I'll just say at value. And if I save that, and I run it, which I can do right now, but uh oh, why is it not? Give me one second. Oh, wait, 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 wait. It's the using, using talk. But my using should be there already. Hmm, that's bizarre. Let me build that really quickly. Oh, I know why. This is complaining because I added this to a component that already exists. So if I had done this in a brand new component, it would work. The reason why it makes a difference is because when in fact you build a component, so yes, you see the CS HTML, but what happens behind the scenes is uh, the Blazor framework will generate the code for you for that CS HTML. And that component itself is not a partial class in C Sharp. If it were a partial class, this would work. That's why it's given an issue. Does that all kind of make sense? Okay. So I'm gonna stop there and close this. What I wanna do is actually show you guys that demo. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new, a new page and do it. We're gonna rename that to Corey Demo. I'm gonna get rid of all of that. That's fine. Come on, stop acting up. And then Corey Demo. Let's get rid of all that crap. I'm gonna change this route, because that's important. And then, Generic demo, control shift B. Then what I'm gonna do is change this class name to match my page. Control shift B, item saved. What's my output look like? Come on build. And this is gonna take some time to build. So this is one downside of Blazor that I do not like, which is Today, because everything compiles to a DLL, it takes a really long time to like rev. You know, we'll make a change and then we'll go run it and then try to get it started up. 
it takes a really long time to get back going. And in this case, it's taken way too long. So I may kill this build process. Give me two seconds. Sorry about that. Da -da -da -da. MS build. Kill that. Did you stop? I still see the background task. Let me control shift B that. I see it building. I see it building. Nothing. That sucks. Sometimes it will be the case, um, and this is the, the same thing happened to me before. Uh, sometimes it will be the case that Visual Studio gets hung up on previous build. And so, specifically with Blazor, and this legitimately happened to me during my last talk. It happens now, like almost in every talk. So I'm gonna consider it a good luck charm. But, in effect, what I've done is I kill the build process, and then eventually it kills the background tasks, and I don't have to kill the Visual Studio process. The last time I did this, I had to kill the Visual Studio process, which sucks. Because I think I'm gonna have to do that right now. So, let me kill that build and we're gonna start it up again. Oh, I don't see it. Damn you. Dev EUV, let's kill that. It's still, the background task is still going, and so it looks like the build is still going, but I killed the process. It has been the case that it will come back eventually, but it doesn't always. Visual Studio 2017. And then while that's coming up, I'm gonna show you all just a quick example. This is kind of what that looks like. I put the wrong thing in there. So in effect, as you have a component that you wanna create, and you want it to have that same code behind experience, this is what your CSHTML code would look like, and then this is what your code behind page should look like which is what we're trying to replicate here. So, let's do this one more time. SVCC, talk, US public, open. I'm gonna change this one last time. Whoops. We're gonna start that build. Now, why are you telling me you couldn't find it? Generic demo. Ah, uh, that's why. Yep, Corey demo. Good old save. Control shift save. Control shift B. What? Oh, hold on. I hate when that happens. Clean the solution. Value isn't a special, um, isn't a special name. Like, you, you see it resolves. Yeah, exactly. Let's change it. And I'll change the name of this, too. So let me actually rename that properly. Corey Demo. And let's change this to custom value. And let's change that to custom value. And that's weird because I see that works. Talk pages. And yet, it's saying that. That is bizarre. Yeah, the IntelliSense is getting way better. I'm gonna apologize, because I actually tried this out last night, because somebody asked me this question yesterday, and I was like, yeah, you could do it, because I've done this. And it worked last night. So I'm wondering if, mm -mm. Uh, because it's a different name. We could take the functions block out and see what happens. Right, but last night when I did this, that didn't cause a problem. Well, that's still 
And now we get to build acting up. Yeah. So you all are getting to see some of the experimental nature of laser. And this is a part of what makes it that much more not ready for prime time. One thing I want to do, because um, I want to make sure I cover this piece, which is the dependency injection. So I'm going to cover that, and I want to come back and see if I can fix this since we have 15 minutes left, which is uh, Blazor tries to give you some stuff out of the box to make developing with it a little bit easier. One of the things that it does is uh, navigation. And so I want to show you the main layout. The main layout is um, a layout that it has just built in, a layout component that it has built into the framework. And so this Blazor layout component comes directly from Microsoft. But what they do is they say, okay, any page that inherits this should have a body tag. And this is how the main content changes within a Blazor app. The flip side to that is the base, this project, demo project, will also give you a navigation menu. And that navigation menu, which is one that is built here, also has this built-in component that Microsoft also gives you called the nav link. Why do they give you this nav link? For two reasons. One is um, you don't always want to be able to say like, hey, you have to match a particular path, right? So this is everything that has to do with routing. So you see every nav link has this match property. This match property has a nav link uh, enum, right? The second is it does some interesting things on your A tags. So if in fact it is, this renders an A tag, if in fact it is that you change the particular page that you're on, it will update the A tag so that that way the active class shows up. Um, this is stuff that's built into Bootstrap. So I appreciate that, but I haven't seen a way to override that behavior. And someone else asked me this question, which is, can you override that nav link class? And I haven't seen a way to do that yet. I would imagine they'd give you a way because everyone doesn't want their navigation links to show up the same way. So it, I just don't think that they've gotten there. The second thing that they give you is dependency injection straight out of the box. So if you notice it, in our imports, um, at the very highest level, you see using system.net.http. That's so that you can use HTTP client inside of any one of your components. The second thing that you'll see inside of, uh, where is it, fetch data. Inside of fetch data is this thing called inject. What this inject does is it says, okay, if in fact it is that you have a service that's already wired up, go ahead and inject it into the page. So you get dependency injection built into the framework straight out of the box. Um, why this is important is because, as we talked about before, when, when it comes to spot applications, which is typically how you'll see Blazor be used right now, what you'll see is uh, a number of different HTTP requests being created uh, to do things, gather data, get additional information about particular um, uh, rest routes or whatever that may be. And so to do that, the way you do it is you add the inject tag, you add the class, and then you add the property name, such that then, once you want to make that request, you literally just use that property. That all making sense? The last thing I want to talk to, and then I want to go fix this problem, is uh, support for uh, generics. So one thing that I really like about Blazor, which oftentimes gets overlooked, is this idea that you can have generic collections. So right here you see like on this page, it just has this weather array, weather forecast array. I could legitimately, in fact, let me see if I can do it right now. I can change this to a generic list and the code will work exactly the same. And why I'm calling this out is because if you do any work in the JavaScript frameworks, uh, Angular, React, Vue, working with arrays very specifically is not a thing that is pleasurable. And so I appreciate that from a C-sharp perspective, you can do the same things that you would normally do with link, with collections, and it would work just straight away in the browser. Now, what does this mean for scenarios where uh, it would not work? So I've seen it be the case where if you do something that is not supported inside of Mono, you'll get this nasty error message in the console. Meaning, whatever you're trying to do has to be supported by Mono. Um, and it won't show up on the browser. It literally shows up in the browser, in the, the dev tools console. Uh, I was looking for an example last night. I couldn't find one. But I say that to say, as you are building out Blazor applications, definitely keep the console open. Because if you were to see something weird, 
it will show up here. And you'll see like the normal red background and all the same text, right? Um, what else did I want to say? I think that's it. Now I want to go fix my component. So give me a second. Let me see if we can get this done. Oh, good question. Debugging is a thing that right now uh, has not worked universally. But the way that it works is there is debugging support inside of uh, Blazor such that if you run Chrome in debug mode, and you open up the CSHTML files inside of Chrome, you can put a breakpoint in there. You can't debug back into Visual Studio yet. That's a thing that I know they're working on. It's just not there yet. And so for me, it's broken because I have, this is one of the places where uh, debugging support that they're building into Blazor has broken my Visual Studio preview build. And it's actually now impacting my full Visual Studio install. But the way it should work is here are my sources you should see the CSHTML files if it were working. You don't see them. And so what you would do is then just step right into those files and add a breakpoint just like you normally would any JavaScript file. I want to stop and see if there was another question. Okay, cool. Now I want to see if I can fix this bug, I mean this issue. So it gets killed to Visual Studio again because the build is still going as we see that thing right there. And Nasty background tasks. So the last time I did that, it took way too long. And we'll see, like this is where I was, I was hoping that they would put some stuff in the output log. Oh, look at that, it finally did, thank God. Yes, okay, so let's save that. Thanks for that suggestion. Let's come back to Corey demo. Don't care about that. Inherits Corey demo. Let me take that and move that up. That's fine. I see that on pages. Corey demo. Get that out. I don't see anything here that shouldn't work. Come back here. Why wouldn't you? So, this is the thing I was just thinking about was instead of doing that, doing talk and seeing if that shows up. Because before I had it, so it resolves. It should have automatically inherited because the view imports has that using right there. And that propagates down. And this, this view imports is at the parent level. And what's interesting is that resolves, but then when I go to build it, it's still looking for generic demo. And that's in the index file. So let's go take a look at the index. And let's take that out. Control save that. Let's take that out. Let's go take a look at the build. Oh, I'm getting success. Now, I want to take that back out because that should still work. Doom! See, make too many changes. <laughs> so let's cancel that. Come on. Okay. Control Shift B. Ooh, so I do have to put it in there so it doesn't pick it up. Come on through. Come on through. Okay. So I've got talk.cory demo. I've got custom value. If I F5 that, that should work. Build succeeded. Now I'm going to come back here. Yeah, it's going to open up all those other browsers, but I'm going to change that to Cori. And 
this is my random default. Now, God, that's forever. Dear Lord. <laughs> I'm glad that we fixed that. <laughs> but that's one way you could do it. Um, the other thing, too, that they talk about, and there are some best practices that are starting to show up. So a good example would be if you decide to um, uh, add event handlers to a page, uh, being very intentional about when to use asynchronous event handlers and when not to because of how threading works. So what that would look like is, I'm just gonna come here to this page, and I'm gonna add a button on the bottom, and uh, we're going to say on click equals uh, refresh. And uh, let's just say refresh, right? We've got bootstrap. I'm gonna add a couple bootstrap classes real quick just to make this look somewhat decent. Button. And then I need to create this refresh. So because it's an event handler as opposed to something that's going to get data, it's not doing any IO or any uh, outbound calls, right? I'm just gonna go ahead and make that avoid method. Um, so let's just say refresh data and here I always do this because spending time inside of the world of JavaScript, I've learned to console log everything. So I'm just gonna say I click the button before I do anything else. And the thing I appreciate about that is, again, nothing you see here is JavaScript, um, right? Like there's nothing that looks remotely like JavaScript, which is fascinating. But then you could also then say, okay, well let me just do this. And I'm gonna steal that really quickly and what I want to do is do forecasts dot clear so I can get rid of that first. Now, why is this complaining? This is complaining because my forecasts is a list. I'm going to go ahead and make this asynchronous, turn that into a task. And then what I want to do is run this. So you see the only reason why I turn that into an asynchronous thing is because I'm doing something outbound. But legitimately, if I was just updating the DOM or I was making a change, I would just keep that as a void method. Um, and you'll notice I'm not putting anything that says public, private, protected, internal, right? Uh, by default, everything's private, but accessible within the scope of the particular uh, component. You can make it public, doesn't make a difference unless you are resharing because you can turn this into a library and share it. Um, that's been the only scenario where I've seen people explicitly say make it public. Other than that, it's been private by not put by omission. Look at this build, it's, it's not working again. I'm a patient guy. Now let's do it again. So build, and now it's working, finally, jeez, and run. And it's gonna open up all those other browsers, blah, 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 Ray, Ray, Ray. I'm gonna come back here, I wanna see if this updates. So the one thing to keep in mind is every time you click that refresh button, I like, I have mine set to automatically reload from the server, but it will, because of that, it's pulling the DLLs. If you're trying to browse around and you refresh the page, it will try to update as much of the app as possible, because it's presuming that it should have everything on its computer already, on a computer already, and if the server says, hey, something's changed, it may go grab everything. So be very careful with how much you click that refresh button. Hey, look at that. Okay, so it's doing something. Now let's see why. Console, stick that to the right. Oh yeah, click the button. All right, and then you'll see it should be making a bunch of outbound requests. And it's making those outbound requests. Okay, so this is the point where I get to stop. We'll jump back into the PowerPoint and we'll say, we did a lot of stuff today. My Lord. I want you to do two things. If you remember nothing else, remember this, blazer.net. 
Everything I did today is covered inside of the documentation on blazer.net. That's the first thing. So you can always go look at that and take a look and see what you think. Second is, I featured it earlier. It's definitely worth taking a look at. I watched it again last night and this morning, the ASP.NET community stand up, where one of the things that they do really well is they talk a lot about some of the UI stuff that you can do. Um, so somebody asked me a question yesterday and I went to go look at the answer, which is can you do things around like WebGL and the browser through Blazor? And right now the way to do that is by doing JavaScript interop. So it's possible, but it may not be recommended yet, right? So some of those interesting unique use cases may be covered um, in the stand-up for you. And with that, hey, thanks for hanging out with me. I really appreciate it. <laughs>